let's start. This will be the point where I cut the recording and start the YouTube part. It's going to be very self-referential, me talking about YouTube. I first want to say that the lecture notes have been updated. I, okay, most of you have got the email saying the lecture notes have been updated, but for the purpose of the students that are just following on YouTube, the lecture notes have been updated. Uh, you can download them from our website. There's now a chapter on UMD, and that's good timing because today we're going to start that chapter, which meant that yesterday I was frantically finishing the chapter, which means it's full of mistakes. So soon enough, there's going to be an updated version with some of the mistakes fixed you know, as we go through it. As always, if you find a mistake, let me know. Now is the perfect time to find mistakes because there are probably a lot of them. And also lecture 13 marks the halfway point of the course because I think there are going to be 26 lectures. It's 13 weeks, two lectures a week. So this is the, the end of the first half. So I think the timing is good. We can finally get to UMD. So I'm going to start with the, with the recollection. Recall from lecture one from the very introduction, the Hilbert transform. So the Hilbert transform of a scalar valued function. So this is a function on R, it can go into C or into R. So let's say it maps into the scalar field K. The Hilbert transform of this function is H of F. It's a function on R. I'll define it as I'll have this normalizing factor out the front that I forgot in lecture one. And it's a, a principal value integral defined like this. And you need this regularization. I don't know what you want to call this, a regularization or it's, it's a chopping off of the singularity, certainly. You have this dy on y, so you have a singularity as y approaches zero. And the function one on y is not integrable. So this is a non-integrable singularity. And to make sense of the, the integral, at least for Schwartz functions, say. Is there a t in Schwartz? I can't remember. Or maybe you want to take a compactly supported smooth function, you know, something nice and regular with very nice decay. If you have good regularity and good decay for every epsilon, these integrals will be defined. And then as you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, that will also be defined, even though the the integral without the limits not defined. So this is a, a singular integral. Somebody needs to mute themselves if they haven't already. Good. And this is probably the most important operator in harmonic analysis. I don't think anybody would disagree with me saying that. Okay, the Fourier transform is the most important operator in harmonic analysis. This is the second most important operator in harmonic analysis. And it is bounded on LP, scalar valued LP for P in the reflexive range of exponents. So this is a theorem. I think I said it was due to Reese. Calvin says in chat, there's a T in this Schwartz, but not in Cauchy Schwartz. Good, thanks. Thanks for the reminder. There's a T here. H is bounded on LP. You prove this by, for example, calderon zygmunt theory or other methods. We're gonna prove it by other methods incidentally in this class. So you don't have to know this. And one of the questions that I formulated in the introduction and then answered is, does the Hilbert transform as a map from LP to itself, does it admit a bounded X valued extension? So remember, if you have a Banach space X and we have a, an operator on a scalar LP space, which is bounded, we can formulate this tensor extension, if you remember that, of the operator with the identity map on the Banach space. Does that map LP or the Bochner space valued in X, does it map that to itself? It's defined on the algebraic tensor product of the scalar value of LP space and X, and does it extend by boundedness and linearity and so on to the Bochner space? And the answer to that, which is by Burke, Holder, and Borgan, in the early to mid 80s, 83, 85, something like that. 
the answer is that for p between one and infinity, uh, h, I won't write it, but h mapping on LP, h admits this extension if and only if x is umd, whatever that means. So I went through this in lecture one in the introduction and I said, this is gonna be like probably the most important theorem of the course or at least one of the goals of the course. And we're finally in a position to say what UMD is. Okay, we, we could have said it earlier, but we're in a position now that we can really discuss it and prove some things. All right. So what is UMD? UMD stands for unconditionality of martingale differences. So let's just remind ourselves what a difference is, what a, what a different sequence of a stochastic process. If I have a, a stochastic process, then the different sequence, DF, this is another stochastic process, and it's defined by DFN is Fn minus Fn minus one with the convention that f minus one is constant zero, or the zero vector, if we're thinking of a vector valued process. The number zero and the zero vector are not the same thing. It's good to distinguish them. So let's define UMD. So actually we're gonna define a scale of properties with an exponent P, which is gonna be called UMDP. And eventually we're gonna see that they're independent of P. It's going to be like this martingale convergence property. We had P martingale convergence property and they turned out to all be equivalent. Same is going to be true for UMD. So let's take an exponent P between one and infinity, not including one or infinity. A Banach space X has the UMDP property. And I'll write out exactly what that is. Unconditionality of martingale differences. And this is in LP, that's what the P stands for. So X has UMDP if there exists a constant C less than infinity such that, let's do a bunch of quantifiers for all probability spaces. Uh, what else do we need? For all X valued LP bounded martingales, F dot on the probability space that we're quantifying over. And for all sequences, uh, Xi N, sequences of signs. These are not random signs. These are just sequences of signs. For all sequences of signs. We have the following estimate. Supremum over N of the norm of the sum from small N up to capital N of Xi N, our sequence of signs times the, the different sequence of the Martin Galef. Measure this in LP. Everything is X valued, of course. This needs to be less than or equal to C times the corresponding supremum without the signs. This is the UMD property. And I'll just quickly point out that this sum here by telescoping is equal to uh, F capital N. Because we're summing up the differences from the zeroth element to the nth element, we get a telescoping effect. The way we've defined it, we get F sub N. Right, and of course we could write this as less than squiggle without the C, if we don't really care what the constant C is. Remember that notation. This constant C doesn't depend on N. It doesn't depend on the choice of F. It doesn't depend on the choice of signs. If you look at this order of quantifiers, there exists C such that for all of this stuff, this holds. 
and we give a name to the best constant in this inequality. The best constant C. So I guess the infimum of all C that satisfy this property. The best constant C is called beta sub P of X. This has a few different names um, in the book analysis in Barnack spaces. I see the question in chat, just a second. The constant uh, yeah, beta sub P of X is called the UMD constant of X or the UMD P constant of X. And this constant does depend on P all the time. So I should have written this C can depend on P. Yeah. Not only can it depend on P, it will depend on P, that constant. The finiteness will not depend on P, but the value will. Right. So that's the UMD property. And we say that X is UMD with no qualifier of P. X is just UMD if it's UMD P for all P. And as I said before, UMD P is going to be independent of P. So actually there's only one property, it's the UMD property. It means that you have this estimate for all P with a constant that depends on P. That's the definition of UMD. Let's look at it for a second and remember it because we're going to be using this quite a lot. The key thing of course is this estimate here. You can sort of forget all of the quantifiers. You just think you have to have this estimate for all finite Martin girls, all sine sequences psi. The, the choice of probability space is not very important. You just need it for all Martin girls. I'll call this estimate star because I need to make reference to it. What this estimate means, or at least an equivalent characterization of it, but what this is called is that the, well, let me start again because I'm not describing it properly. This estimate says that the sequence DF, the different sequence of F, is unconditional in LP. And this, if you do a little bit of functional analytic reasoning, which I haven't done in the notes, but I've pointed to a reference where you can see it, this is equivalent to saying that the sequence, the series, the infinite series of different sequences converges independently of the ordering. Converges or diverges. So this fact that you could put in arbitrary signs along finite subseries and still have this kind of estimate is controlled by the, the series without the signs. If you do the reasoning, which I haven't done, will tell you that actually you can reorder the series in any way you like, and it's still gonna converge to the same thing, if it does converge. Or if you reorder it, it's always gonna diverge, no matter which ordering you take. Of course, okay. this right, so basically what happens is either this, either this right hand side is going to go to infinity or it's going to converge and that's going to determine the convergence of any reordering of the series you take. There was a question. Uh, is this really equivalent to the UMD property if every different sequence is uh, unconditional? Because a priori that would just mean that for every sequence there's such a C, right? Um, no, just, just for the Martingale different sequences. So it's not every sequence. Yeah, but sequences of I mean, form. every sequence of this of this type, yeah. Yep. This, unless I've made a mistake somewhere, yes, this is exactly what the UMD property is. So if there's some C, then the C is actually uniform. Yes, in fact. Oh, okay. yeah, no, I see your point. Could it be that for, uh, Yes, there, there's a bit of an argument that's needed here, but yes, if you can get some C for every infinite martingale and this C doesn't depend on which martingale you take. Oh, hang on, I'm confusing myself. You're asking if there's a C that, if given every martingale, there exists a C that depends on the martingale. Yeah. As long as you take infinite martingales, I 
we'll check this more rigorously, but I'm 90% sure, yes, this will give you a uniform C by a uniform boundedness argument. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, so the issue with going backwards from, if you converge independent of any ordering, showing that it's unconditional, is that where the issue is? Like with whether or not the constant's uniform or? Um, that's part of it anyway. Right, okay. There's a couple of issues here, yeah. You have to, right. let me give you just a hint of how this argument would work. This is phrased in terms of martingales, but if you have this kind of unconditionality, then you know that your space will actually have this martingale convergence property. So you have an LP bounded martingale and you know it's going to have some limit F. And so this is actually a statement about all um, conditional expectation operators along filtrations. So it's a statement about operators acting on functions rather than on martingales. And we're gonna come back to that argument later on actually, which should make it more clear. Thanks. I'm just going to point out these are good questions and you've put me on the spot and I can't give you the authoritative answer immediately. I think it works, but let's see. We might see that it doesn't. <laughs> well, for, for the uniformity of the constant, now suppose the constant is not uniform. So then you have yeah. a sequence of martingales for which the constant goes bad, right? Yeah. But can you not put all this, this whole sequence of martingales, just nest them into one single martingale and then you use uniform bounds for this one and then Maybe you could, maybe you could. The difficulty is gonna be, I think, if you take different, very different filtrations, maybe you might lose some compatibility. Yeah. Okay. You might not be able to exactly attach them together. These are good questions. I've got good okay. students yeah. in this class yeah. immediately pointing out my misunderstandings. Yeah. The definition I've stated is the right definition, whether that truly means, okay, unconditionality of every Martin Gell difference individually. I think it does, but maybe I'm wrong. We're not going to need that level of insight in this course. <laughs> and for anybody who didn't get what we were just talking about, don't worry about it. We, it's not going to be too important. Let's move on from that. So the property that I defined certainly implies that every Martingale difference sequence is unconditional in a uniform way. Yeah. That's going to be enough for us. Let's start giving examples of UMD spaces. I've made a definition. I need examples. The first and easiest example, every Hilbert space, H is UMD2. And the constant beta2 is one. In fact, you can say something else stronger than this. We'll see it in the proof. Let's take a Hilbert valued martingale. So an H valued martingale on some probability space with respect to some filtration that I'm not mentioning. Then for all sequences of signs, Xi n, these are plus or minus one for all capital N. What we use is that, well, I'll write down the estimate and I'll tell you what we use. We need to estimate this, Xi N DFN in L2 valued in H. Now this Bochner space, L2 valued in a Hilbert space, this is a Hilbert space again with the natural inner product. It's the integral, the inner product of F and G is the integral of F against G and this F against G is the inner product in H. So it gets an inner product and this sequence DFN, these are pairwise orthogonal. And this is by independence. When you have a Hilbert valued martingale the different sequence is going to be independent. Uh, yeah, it's going to be independent and therefore orthogonal. Just as in scalar valued probability, independence, independence of two functions actually corresponds to orthogonality. So when you have the norm of a, of a sum of pairwise orthogonal things in a Hilbert space, let's take its square here, that's what I'm doing. Its norm is actually given by the sum of the squares of the norms. So we have a chi n squared, df n squared. 
this comes from orthogonality with the vectors of the functions. Now these psi n's are all plus or minus one, right? So they all square to one. So we could ignore that. And we just have the sum over n of d f n squared n from zero to n. And we can reverse the whole argument using the orthogonality of these things and say, okay, it's what we started with, but now the signs have been removed. And that's it. So actually the estimate that we needed, if we take the supremum over all n and over all martingales, this tells you that beta two h is less than or equal to one, but actually it tells you that it's equal to one because every inequality here was actually inequality, yeah? So in the UMD property, which is up here, in this estimate star up here, in the case of Hilbert spaces, you have equality with constant one. So Martingale difference sequences in Hilbert spaces are actually orthogonal sequences. So you can say something much stronger. And this gives us a bit of insight into what the UMD property is saying. It's saying that Martingale difference sequences behave roughly like orthogonal sequences. And that's the, the key insight in the UMD property. This is why UMD property works well for harmonic analysis, for Banach valued analysis and harmonic analysis in particular. You don't have orthogonality arguments, but you do know that Martingale different sequences behave like orthogonal sequences. And you exploit that as much as possible. So that's the, the first example, Hilbert spaces. The UMD two, and once we see the p-independence of the UMD property, we'll see that they're UMD. Okay, so for the next result, we need a bit of preparation. We have time for it, luckily. We're going to rephrase the UMD p property in a somewhat more convenient way. At least it lets us run abstract arguments on the UMD property. I'll state now that UMDP is equivalent to uniform boundedness of what I'll call finite martingale sine transforms. So if you if you're used to martingale transforms, you can already see what this is. What is a finite martingale sine transform? Given a, what are we given? I have to remind you how Martingale transforms work. Given a finite Martingale. So when I say a finite Martingale, I mean it's, inde it's indices only go up to some capital N. We don't go all the way to infinity. We can do that. So given a finite Martingale valued in X and a finite sequence of signs, this would be Xi n, only going up to capital N, valued in plus minus one. We have to recall what Martingale transforms were. We didn't talk about this very much. So remember we had, if we have a Martingale F and a sequence of coefficients, which in this case is Xi, we can define a transformed Martingale Xi dot F And it's defined through its different sequence. So the nth difference is given by the nth coefficient psi n times the nth difference of the martingale f. Or equivalently, uh, the kth element of the sequence is the sum from n up to k of the differences of f times the coefficients psi n. Remember this? It's what a Martingale transform is. And this gives you a Martingale back. As long as your sequence of coefficients is predictable, in this case, it's deterministic. So it's completely predictable. They're just constants. So we get a Martingale. The UMDP property says exactly that for all finite. Mar I'm going to start abbreviating Martingales like this. Does anybody have any issue with that? Miguel's. Martingales. 
and sine sequences. The transformed martingale at, uh, we want for all n, don't we? Let's write it like this. This is another way of writing down the UMD property. When if you have a finite martingale and a finite sign sequence and you transform the martingale by the sign sequence, you have a, a uniform bound of this form. So I'm gonna write it with the squiggle here. This constant is uniform in N and F and Xi. And have I forgotten anything else? That's all the data I've got, right? Yeah. So this is another way of formulating the UMD property in terms of Martingale transforms instead of unconditionality of you know certain sequences. It's the same thing. It's just reformulated in a different way. And we can take this formulation and we can reformulate it again to get an even more convenient formulation in terms of filtrations. Suppose we're given a filtration, A sub N. It's a finite filtration. We're, well, we're also talking about finite things here. So suppose we're given a finite filtration on a probability space. And we're also given a sequence of signs as before. Uh, yeah, don't worry about that. It's a sequence of signs. We know what that is. We can define an operator which we'll call T sub A Xi. So this is an operator depending on this data. It's gonna be an operator on L1 valued in X. And we define it like this. T A Xi of a function F is the sum up to capital N of Xi N D F N, which is of course Xi dot F N. And the important definition to make here is that F sub N is the conditional expectation with respect to A sub N of F. So given a filtration and given a function, we can construct the associated martingale and then we can transform that martingale by a sequence of signs. So this is gonna be a formulation of the UMD property in terms of boundedness of operators on functions rather than operators on martingales. And this is going to be convenient because functions are a bit easier to think about than martingales. And what everything above proves, we've actually proven everything already. A proposition, which doesn't need a proof. If X is a Barnack space, or for a Barnack space X, the UMD constant or the UMD P constant of X is equal to the supremum over all probability spaces, over all filtrations, and over all sign sequences of the norm of this operator, T A X I, as an operator on LP. Yep. I don't need to say anything else about that. So with this whole discussion of trivialities of this reformulating the UMD property, we've already proven this. This just follows from the definitions and the things we've said. Is anybody confused about that? Have I gone too fast? Seems okay. Um, is it hard to show that that supremum is attained on a Barnack space? <laughs> I'm guessing it is. Like it doesn't like need to be attained. Verify, like you want to find what this constant is. Like so, the thing is that all of the filtrations and sign sequences I'm taking this supremum over are finite. Right. And it could be that the supremum's actually attained along an infinite filtration. Nothing's stopping that from happening. So it's the supremum over all finite input data, which is convenient because it's when you're doing proofs with these things, it's much easier. Like these operators that are defined here, they are bounded a priori. You don't need any, they're just finite sums of things that are bounded on L1. They're just not necessarily uniformly bounded in LP. 
they're bounded in LP, but they're not necessarily uniformly bounded. The thing is that the corresponding infinite versions where you take an infinite filtration and an infinite sum, they don't need to be bounded at all. So defining them a priori is a little bit tricky. So you take these finite ones, which are defined and are bounded, and you just ask for uniform bounds. So the, the consequence of that is, yeah, this supremum doesn't need to be attained, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> Finding the, firstly, knowing whether it's attained even on infinite sequences, I don't know whether it is attained. It probably is, but I can't tell you that immediately. I think it is. But then finding the exact UMD constants, this is insanely hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only one, let me give you just an example. It's in the notes and I wasn't going to do it in the lecture. And I'm certainly not going to prove it. It is known that the UMD constant of a Hilbert space is equal to the maximum of P and the whole of conjugate P prime. So this is always something that's greater than two minus one with equality. Yeah, it's by Burkholder. And unless I'm mistaken, this is the only UMD constant which is known explicitly, except for the infinite ones. There are all the UMD spaces you know, you know that the constant is finite, but you don't know what it is exactly. Only in the Hilbert space case do you know that exactly. And yeah, I don't understand the proof of this fact either. But I'm not going to teach it. If you like exact constants, that's a problem to go look at. Exact UMD constants of Barnack spaces. Good luck. Right, where was I? Um, UMD constant of X is given by the supremum over finite filtrations and finite sign sequences of these finite Martin-Gale sign transforms. And this characterization is gonna be very useful for this duality proposition that we're gonna prove. And this is really useful. If we take a P between one and infinity, X a Barnack space, then X has the UMD P property, if and only if the dual space X star has UMD P prime. This is quite useful. So this doesn't behave like something like the Rado Nicodemus property where maybe X doesn't have it, but it's dual does. In the case of UMD, you have this perfect stability under duality. X has UMD P if and only if X star has UMD P prime. And not only that, but the UMD constant, the UMD P constant of X is equal to the UMD P prime constant of X star. Also convenient. And now we have all the ingredients of the proof. If you're quick, you've seen how the proof works, but I'm gonna just do it and we're gonna really make sure the technicalities are all okay. We're gonna do it with this Martingale sign transform characterization over here. Let's fix a finite filtration. And a finite sign sequence. We're going to suppose that F is in LP valued in X. And we're going to take a function G, which is in LP prime of the dual space. We're going to test these norms by duality. And what do we need in order to, to do this? These are the technicalities. We want to show, and in fact we have, that these sign transforms are adjoint to each other. And I'm going to say why that is, because there are little technicalities. So this isn't quite proven yet. This is obvious in a sense, but there are technicalities. Why do we have this? This is true because the corresponding thing is true for conditional expectations. And these sign transforms are just linear combinations of those. So it's enough to know this adjoint relation 
and this is true because it holds for the scalar versions. So scalar conditional expectation operators are adjoint to each other in this way. And it follows through an exercise, which is exercise 2.8, which I presume you've done by now, because it's back in chapter two. If you have an adjoint relation for scalar operators, and if these scalar operators admit bounded extensions, then the bounded extensions satisfy the same adjoint relation. This is true for conditional expectations. So we have this adjoint property for these sign transforms. And the result follows from that, but I'm going to have to say what we really need to invoke to, to make all this truly work. We want to look at the, the norm of one of these transforms on, on LP. So we need to look at how it acts on LP functions. This is equal to, wait, hang on. We don't put an F here. <laughs> We're looking at the norm of an operator, not the norm of a function. What's the definition of the norm of an operator? It's the supremum over F in LP. I'm not going to write F in LP, I'll just write F. So it's the supremum of LP norms when you apply it to LP functions. Normalized appropriately, I'll skip all of that. And how do we evaluate the LP norm here? We can evaluate that by duality. So this becomes the supremum over F and G. of the duality pairing here. This is true because LP prime, what space am I working on, omega? So the, L, the Bochner space LP prime valued in X star is a subset of the dual of LP valued in X and it's norming. We proved that way back in week one, I think, or two. This is one of our first results we had. So now we can use this adjoint relation that we know and put that operator onto G. And then we can say, okay, this is the supremum over G of the norm of T A dot Xi dot of G in LP prime, LP prime, yep. And now if you're very careful, you'd say, aha, why do we know this? What we're using here is that LP valued in X is a subset of the dual of LP prime valued in X star. But we don't know yet that that's norming, do we? Because we don't know that X is reflexive. So what we'd actually want on the left-hand side here is X double star. And then we could say that that was norming, but we don't have that. It is still true that this space is norming, but we haven't proven yet. We haven't proven that yet because back when I proved this norming result, I proved a slightly simplified version that doesn't let you do this. But if you modify the proof slightly, you can get this too. So I see the notes for this. That's why I was being so careful with this proof because we actually need to invoke a result that we don't have yet. <laughs> but this result is true. Without assuming X is reflexive, this is still true. It uses that X is norming in its double dual. Anyway, that is true. And this is the norm of this operator on LP prime. That should be a curly L. Right. That's all clear. It's all good. Little technicalities like this always come up. You have to be careful with them. So the norm of this sine transform on LP valued in X is equal to the norm of the same sine transform on LP prime valued in X star, yeah? So now you take the supremum over all A and all Xi, and you find that the UMD P constant of X is equal to the UMD P constant of X star, which is what we needed to show. So really this whole proof is just saying the the Martin girl transforms that characterize the UMDP property are self-adjoint, <laughs> right? 
or at least the adjoint to the corresponding operators on LP prime if you're looking at the LP operators. And that was all we wanted to show, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So using this duality, you can construct new examples of UMD spaces from old ones. You know that if X is UMD P, then X star is UMD P prime. So we can think, does that give us any more examples we didn't already know? It does not, because the only examples we have are Hilbert spaces, they're UMD2. So then it follows that the dual of a Hilbert space is also UMD2, but we already knew that because the dual of a Hilbert space is a Hilbert space. <laughs> so this doesn't help us yet. We need more examples of spaces to say anything good. And the funny thing is we can't really construct any examples until we know the P independence. So we're still kind of talking a lot about Nothing at this point. We're getting there. Um, let's take a break before we get to the next proposition. Oh, I'll tell you the proposition. We'll prove it after the break because we have time. Let's take P between 1 and infinity, as always. And let's suppose that X is a UMD P space. We don't know of any of these yet, except for Hilbert spaces. But let's presume we know some, right? And let's take a sigma finite measure space. Then the Bochner space LP valued in X is also UMDP. So if you know any UMDP spaces, you can construct more UMDP spaces. And furthermore, the UMDP constant of LP valued in X is the UMDP constant of X. So if you have a UMDP space and you take LP of that, you get another UMDP space for free. You don't lose anything in the constant. I'll prove that after the break. Are there any questions? No, all good. If we'll come back, uh, someone's unmuted themselves. Do you hear me? I can sort of hear you. You need to put your microphone closer. Do you hear me? Now I can hear. I'll turn it up. Yeah. So, uh, I have a question. What about this n term, p equal to 1 and p equal to infinity? No spaces satisfy the corresponding estimate, it turns out. So if you have a Barnack space, which is UMDP, mm -hmm. possibly including 1 or infinity, right? Then every subspace also has that property. So in particular, if any Barnack space is UMD1 mm -hmm. or UMD infinity, then the scalar field is also UMD1 or UMD infinity. And you can actually show with explicit counter examples that that's not true. So the scalar field doesn't satisfy the endpoint properties. I haven't written that out and I probably should. I might add that to the notes. So this is why there's the restriction away from one and infinity. It simply never holds. It's like type and cotype. I define type P as being P less than or equal to two because it doesn't hold for P greater than two. It cannot hold for p greater than two. Okay. UMD one doesn't hold. There is a version of the UMD one property which is a bit relaxed. Yeah. And then L one has a UMD one, but it's not the same UMD property. Okay. Yeah. But are there like in that case maybe uh, like UMD log UMD kind of properties? So I didn't hear the second part of the um, question. Again, sorry. So uh, in that case, are there is there anything that generalizes like the I mean, I mean, so the problem is that the Hilbert transform is not bounded near L1, uh, like at the, in L1, right? But yeah, this is actually exactly just what Calvin said in chat. The Hilbert transform result I mentioned earlier, this doesn't hold in L1 or L infinity either. So. But if you do something like uh, L1 log L1, then it does. So, so is there ah, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I think you can do this. I think you have some generalizations where you replace L1 with a slightly different space. And it turns out that the corresponding property is often equivalent to UMD, actually. Often when you have one of these generalized endpoint results, it means you've actually got the result for general P in the reflexive range. And it turns out it's equivalent. There are some slightly weaker generalizations though that are not equivalent. And I might talk about them later on, but I'll skip over them for now just to avoid confusion. Yeah, that in short, yes, there are generalizations and some of them are not equivalent to UMD, but some of them are. <laughs> 